On this episode of the Philosophy Society podcast, I talk to mathematician Nick Hodskin. We discuss artificial intelligence, how we learn mathematics, where the negative and unreal numbers exist, and how science works in tandem with maths to solve issues in the world. Many people don't understand how mathematics can be a tool for navigating the world. This is a podcast we all must listen to. Have you heard of AlphaGo? Oh, yeah, there's AlphaZero, which is chess, and then AlphaGo, which was... Okay. Uh, yeah, it might have been AlphaZero. So, oh, there was... AlphaZero. Oh, no, it was AlphaGo. So AlphaGo can play chess and Go. Oh, right, okay. Right, so in 2017, they Beat programmed the this AlphaGo. They didn't even teach the thing to play chess. They, yeah. like, gave it... <laughs> they, gave, they programmed it with the ability to learn chess. It took it, like... Two or three hours, it learnt chess, and then it beat the grandmaster. But it didn't just beat the grandmaster; it like got to a point where it knew it had won the game, and then it started like toying with him. It's messed up. <laughs> I should look into that. I heard of Alpha Zero, which was basically kind of the same thing, where they they told this artificial intelligence like, "Hey, these are the the rules for chess." Just hear the rule. It's uh, how about you win, and then just like so, it took that in memory, and then it played against itself for like four hours on end, and then um, like came out the end, uh, came out the end of it, and was put, pitted against Stockfish, which is like the best chess engine out there. But it doesn't oh, use yeah. it doesn't use deep learning. It just uses um, iteration and like some other tricks. Deep learning being the ability to learn. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so um, not programming it with any specific skills, but programming it to teach itself shit. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's not really a topic that I'm too familiar with, but um, yeah, the ability to kind of improve and discover underlying kind of patterns that may not be evident to the to humans, I guess. But yeah, it beat Stockfish. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't night and day, but I mean, I guess to them it was night. You know, it's like small small advantages that um, compile and then just... See, wipe, what's awesome about up. that, dude, about that is, I mean, taking back to what we were saying before, right, mm. you can, with a computer, there's a couple of things you can do. You can program the computer with the rules to play chess or you can program the computer with the ability to learn how to play chess and the one that learns how to play chess ends up better at chess than the one that you just taught how to play chess. Yeah. <laughs> then we start talking about people in a classroom learning mathematics, right? Should we be teaching those people to learn specific things in maths? Should we be teaching them, like, the rules of manipulating quadratic formulas? And we might have to do that, but shouldn't we also at the same time be focusing on teaching them the ability just to learn, and to just problem-solve for themselves? I mean, like, when people go out into the world, right, that's what they end up doing. Mm. They end up teaching their self stuff. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point you bring up, but I think, I, I don't know whether, I guess when it comes to school, um, I, I don't necessarily know whether the shortcomings are in the content being taught or the lack of attention. To Where's the, the shortcomings? Like, when I'm thinking of, like, school, especially in, like, maths class or something, you have... Um, 30 people in a class and it's difficult for a teacher to kind of keep track of all the students and where they are in the maths and I think a lot of uh, this is like I, I guess the reason that I feel that maths is like very inaccessible to people especially like uh, I mean whenever I say hey I like people ask me oh what do you study and I'm like oh Oh, this again, okay. Um, <laughs> um, I'm studying maths and data science, and then the reaction is like one of one of four things. It's like, oh, you <laughs> you must be so smart, or the second one is like, oh, that must be so difficult, and then the third one's like, oh, I can never do maths. It's just I find it so impossible. And uh, like ever since ever since primary school, I think I got to year ten, and it's just all of a sudden maths was just so difficult. I used to be top of the class, and then bam. I had to go to applications or something <laughs> along those lines. But the thing is, it's like... And then the fourth response, of course, is like, oh, yeah, that's cool. That's a, that's a response I hope I get. But <laughs> it is uh, it doesn't happen too often, <laughs> depending on the audience, of course. But, yeah. 
I think my yeah. response would just be, why the fuck? <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah, why? <laughs> but that's said from someone that studies philosophy, and I probably get the exact same responses as you, except at the end of the day, you're probably going to come out of your degree with a job. It's it's funny though because when when I tell people that uh, oh I do maths so it's like they have that initial reaction which is like oh I can't do maths or something along those lines and then they finish it off with like well where does that lead to <laughs> where does it lead to yeah I mean <laughs> what, like, why why do we, like what's even the purpose of learning pure maths it seems so disconnected sometimes yeah. and I would say the same thing about philosophy right mm. like sometimes the debate that philosophers have you got to shake your head and say, like, why the hell are we having this debate? It just ends up with random stuff. But in my limited or relatively limited exposure to maths, sometimes it's like, why the hell am I factorising this polynomial function? Well, okay, okay. I think there's there's multiple kind of layers to this. I guess um, I think there's with maths there's different stages you can different, different there's different degrees you can take it to right like and the, the way that i view it is it's kind of like a tower right so you build the foundations that is your factions your bimdas uh your indices like even just working in a deductive way like doing that those mathematical op- operations in a way that you aren't introducing information that doesn't exist and you aren't stripping away information that was already there so those are like the two things those are your foundations. And then the floor above that could be your functions and your quadratics and stuff like that. And then above that would be your integration, differentiation. And then it's basically these layers of a tower. And compare that to something like biology. And I don't know if you would, the tower metaphor really works because with a tower, at least with maths, you can't build the first floor until you've built the foundation. right? And that's what makes it really difficult because people look at the 10th floor, people doing these um, differential calculus and this um, differential geometry, and then they're like, oh my God, that is so out of reach. But in reality, like the difference between someone doing differential geometry and someone doing uh, uh, fractions is that they're just working on different floors. It's like walking through the city and you see a 10th office window and thinking, wow, that's so far out of reach, but you don't realise that you can walk in, walk inside and then slowly walk up the stairs and you'll get there eventually. It's yeah. Like if you just see the window and, like, you didn't realise that there was anything below it, it's just kind of like floating <laughs> up there, it would seem inaccessible. Right? Exactly, yeah. I think um, that's the thing, though. People do see it floating because, <laughs> <laughs> because they don't see everything below it. I mean, it makes, it makes math seem very inaccessible. And the thing that I... The gripe that I have is that... A lot of the people I talk to, they um, they don't have the the grasp on the foundations, and the foundations themselves aren't too difficult to grasp. It just may be a bit more boring, which I understand. Um, it's like I mean, working with fractions is like not as interesting or spicy as working with like differentiation and integration and all these like different topics. But it is. I feel like when people look at maths, and especially what I feel is people will go through primary school, they'll go through uh, beginning of high school, they'll be learning the foundations, but they're not learning them in a robust way. And especially when it comes to the deductive working and making sure they're not losing information or introducing um, things that don't exist, I feel like that sort of... They, their skills there are lacking and because of that they get to year 10 and 11 when they start working on the first floor and their foundations are crumbly and then when they realize oh this is very difficult it's because of those crumbling foundations just like dissolving away from underneath them and they might think it is due to the fact that it's differentiation and integration i think it's due to the like crumbling foundations it's like it's it's a shame because um the people that I have worked with, we go back to the foundations and we kind of solidify them. And um, after you solidify them and like get them thinking in the right way, then the, they they flourish. They flourish, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's just they realise that it's actually not that more that difficult. And it's mathematical mathematics. It's 
not black magic, it's just logic. Look, I agree with you to an extent, but, and I was pretty good at math when I was at school, I've just picked up this advanced logic unit, and sometimes I'm doing it and I'm like, what the fuck? But, like, sometimes it's just, I mean, I don't know what foundation to go back to. So, so there's two things that I want to talk about your tower. The first thing is, how do we know where the foundations are? Like, the very foundations, right? Because sometimes it appears like we're just, we're just thrown into one of the floors in the building. That, that's what it can appear like mm. um, when you haven't been introduced to the thing properly. A, where the hell is the foundations here? Right? And then I think the second question that is the real kicker for people with maths is like, where the hell is this building going? Right? Because this was my thinking when I was in year 12. I'm sitting in this maths class learning about complex numbers that, what, don't even, do they, I don't even, I don't even know if they exist or not, right? But they're, they're these weird things. Well, what about negative numbers? Do they exist? I don't know. You're the mathematician. Yeah. Tell me. Do okay. they? Can, do, does negative one exist? Well, okay. This, uh, I guess this is a, this is interesting, right? Does a half exist? Yeah. Why? Why does it exist? Can I can I have half a water bottle? I don't. Yes. If I cut my water bottle in half, <laughs> can I cut my water bottle in half? Then yeah. Have half of one. I think uh, it's it's interesting, like the evolution of numbers, right? Because like. Of course, we'd have started with like the natural numbers, which uh, would be like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way to whatever, where people are just counting their sheep, and then they realize that hey, this concept of a half, I mean, it's new, but it would be good to model like sacks of grain, you know, it's like half a sack of grain, you know, it's half full. So then, like, oh. I don't know about this one, <laughs> Bob. I think this this is a bit far to left field for us. And then they get more into it. And I'm like, okay, actually, uh, half that was a, that was a good shout. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then further down the line, I'm just imagining mathematicians like trying to invent numbers like with their sacks of grain. Yeah, back at uh, Pythag. <laughs> <laughs> Pythag's actually just sitting around counting grain. Yeah. I think uh, it might have been a few years before Python, but yeah, maybe maybe back like 4,000 years ago. But even then, like, uh, even like negative numbers, it's like, okay. It's, uh, <laughs> same guy comes along, it's like, <laughs> hey, um, how are negative numbers? It's like, what the hell are you on? <laughs> and, but what then, are you smoking, mate? Yeah, what are you smoking? And then the guy's like, okay, hear me out. This guy owes me money. So he owes me $10. How about we just represent me owing him money as negative $10? You know, it's, it's 10, but in the opposite direction. But does it stop existing at that point? Well, the thing is, it's like maths. Because I can't, like, I can point to this water bottle here and I'm like, there's one of them. If I had another bottle, I can come along and I'm like, I'm going to define these things as being having the property of two mm. right and then if i add another water bottle i can be like that has the property of three and if i had one water bottle and i chopped it down the middle i can be like and and grabbed one of those parts i can be like that has the property of a half but how can i come along and be like what's 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 it like my water bottle doesn't like disappear then it's zero maybe but then how does how do i get negative water bottles i think the limitation there isn't really maths is we use it to represent the world around us and uh when we encode something in maths there's an interpretation there now negative like in terms of water bottles negative one water bottles doesn't make sense just like um something like 0.5 0.5 sheep well like half a sheep doesn't really make sense in the in terms of a person like counting their herd <laughs> and it's, uh, got munched away by like a mouse man or something but the thing is it's like it's uh, mathematics is the the way that i view it is it's a way for us to look at the world and model it around us and basically take um something that exists and extract meaning from it work with that meaning in a logically deductive way 
ex- arrive at a conclusion and reapply it to the real world. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're hundred percent right. I I feel like you can't have negative water bottles. But in terms of like distance or something like that, if someone if or displacement, if you have one meter to the right, negative one meter to the right could be interpreted as one meter to the left. You know, and having that sort of um, construct opens the gates to new areas of maths. And the same goes for complex numbers. It's like, I know that it's, it's like, there's, there's even discussion, like imaginary wasn't the right word to call it because, <laughs> because as soon as you start saying numbers are imaginary, people just switch off the like, what, <laughs> you know? But I mean, in the same way that negative numbers don't really make sense to like count water bottles, Complex numbers don't make sense to count um, meters or something like that. But the benefit of complex numbers is that there are situations where you want to use them. So stuff like electrical circuits, there is this um, relationship that you can use. Com- you can use complex numbers in terms of electrical circuits relating the uh, current with the resistance and I think it's inductance. It's been a while since I've done physics, but yeah, it's it's using this kind of extraction to this new mathematical concept has opened up the gates for us to use these tools to that context and it really is um i feel like uh, going back like maths really is like examining the world extracting the meaning that we want to extract working with that meaning to form a conclusion that we know is 100 percent correct as long as our interpretation of the real world was correct and as long as our deductive reasoning through the maths is correct, and as long as our conclusion being shoved back into the real world is correct, then we've got a completely deductively valid argument there. But um, it has to be correct. So, so isn't it completely possible that like the foundations don't apply universally? So like even things that, and well, I'm going to chuck in a bit of physics here, even things that we think a dead set certain and I don't I'm not as knowledgeable as the foundations of maths as I am the foundations of like logical systems but say the law of non-contradiction so we can't have something that's P and not P and it's always the case that something either is P or not P Right, so there's those are a couple of things that we just take for granted about the world, right? This can't be a water bottle and not be a water bottle at the same time. But when you start doing crazy quantum physics stuff, those like laws seem to like start breaking down. I right, th- so and with our maths as well, we have these like well, what we think they're foundational axioms. And then stuff starts getting really complex, and then like the whole, it seems like the whole building starting to like crumble. Very much disagree with that. I think um, so. I think uh, when uh, with maths, yeah, you do have your axioms. Um, I don't really know like the exact list of like the axioms that we yeah. use. Um, I probably should look them up because yeah, I think it would be very interesting. But from those axioms, which I guess one of them would be um, like a circle is defined as um, a shape where every point on the circumference is like equidistant from one point, you know, just by definition. Um, But from there and these different axioms, we use them to deductively lead towards a conclusion. And I guess this in some respect is different from like my, I guess the interpretation deductive working and the conclusion aspect is a very applied mathematician way of looking at things that's that's what i um that's the kind of field that i'm interested in but in terms of like the working with axioms those axioms already exist in the mathematical world there's no interpretation needed there so there's not ambiguity so you have these things that are true or assumed to be true you work with them to form this theorem And then that theorem is guaranteed to be true anyway. Okay, so here's my problem. Mm -hmm. So if the fundamental axioms of mathematics are going to be definitions, say, right, then I agree in that case that 
what we're going to deduce, provided we follow the definitions as we created them, right? What we're going to deduce is going to be something that's logically valid, right? And interestingly, that's just going to be like an implication of our fundamental axioms. But if I want to say something about the world or apply it to the world, right, it seems like our foundations have to be something about the world, whereas the definitions that we have is almost like something that we've created rather than something that we've been given from the world. And that, I think, is the bridge between mathematics and physics whereas mathematics is kind of these constructs from us physics is kind of looking at the world and saying okay how can we apply our equations to the world and sometimes we get the interpretation wrong like newton he had his force equals mass times acceleration and all that stuff and then einstein came along and was like actually he's kind of wrong um, and then came up with these new equations to apply and it's this but why, why why think einstein's right then like maybe exactly. maybe Nick Hodgkins comes along oh. in ten years' time. It's like over, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over. <laughs> possibly. I, that's the thing, though. It's like it is these theories, and it's the um, the science works with those theories until it doesn't, and then once it doesn't work, then we apply new theories. But the maths is the tools that we use to look at those situations, and you kind of use. That's the thing with like. Uh, with physics, it's just, you have these theories and like even chemistry, physics, a lot of different sciences, they have these theories and they get replaced by newer, updated theories as, as more relevant inf information comes along. So there's two things I want to ask and I'm going to ask both of them and then take a pick first and then we'll go to the second one. Firstly, I've never really thought about this before until the last five minutes. But what we do with maths is make these definitions and then somehow physicists apply those definitions to the world, right? So how the hell do we create this system that seems like axiomatic from our system, from our definitions, and then manage to apply that to the world, right? Where there is a possibility that I could come along and create some sort of mathematical system where the axioms that I create are like almost contradictory to the other axioms of the other mathematical system, right? And then the things that I deduce are like completely different, right? Now, they both just start with axiomatic definitions that I have defined, right? So how do we know that the system that we've created is going to be able to be applied to like the world of physics? versus when we could have created any sort of other almost arbitrary system? Or is that like a question that's just like, don't go there? Uh, I don't really know much in terms of uh, that sort of talk. I did talk to one of my... Uh, I actually pretty much asked my one of my lecturers the exact same question. It's like, are there any axioms that are a bit dubious that um, if we kind of changed it, it would change all the theorems that... You know, it would invalidate all the theorems that came down from it. I guess my question was, like, are there theorems that are wrong? And um, have there been theorems that have been proved to be wrong? And it's, it is an interesting topic to kind of go into. Um, I think in terms of our, um, our existing axioms, they are pretty sound because they um, have been based around, like, our experiences of life. Well, they've which, worked. Exactly, yeah. I guess they've... Yeah, they have worked and they've been kind of, I guess it is to some extent um, our experiences of the world around us and maybe that experience is not accurate and that is probably a topic that I'm very unqualified to speak on. But um, yeah, it is an interesting question. I Okay, so I want to bring up one point now and then we can change tax if you want. When we're talking about, say, philosophy of science, the, the really common conception about science is that science is a really good tool to find us the truth, right? Now, I actually disagree with that assumption. Now, what I think science does is it observes a number of things, a number of events that have happened in the past, 
and then it goes, okay, here is a coherent a set of principles that we can use to coherently explain those past events. Now, to coherently explain past events is to not draw on any principle in any of those explanations that would contradict another principle that you've had to use. Right? So, the thing that's really interesting about that is that when we observe a number of events, right, there's a number of possible coherent explanations. Right? So, if I walked outside and that chair was over, <laughs> right, I could make like an infinite number of coherent explanations. Yeah. I could be like, yeah, there was a dude in here today who like knocked the chair over and then um, just walked out of the building. And then I could say, oh, well, there was an alien spacecraft that came <laughs> along today and it flew in through the, the window of Reed Library yep. <laughs> and then knocked over the chair, um, abducted someone and then left. Or I could be like, okay, some guy knocked over the chair today, then jumped out of the window and flew away like a bird. Yeah. Right? Now, they're all coherent yeah. with the explanation of the chair falling over. Exactly. Right? Now, then what happens is I make more observations and the principles that I have to draw on to make those observations would contradict some of the principles that I would have to draw on to make a number of uh, a series of the other explanations right so if I then observed that I haven't like every time a human's tried to fly he just fall into the ground <laughs> right I would be like okay well humans can't overcome gravity by using their arms as wings yeah right and that would mean, that would like cross out the explanation that the guy knocked over the chair and then flew out the window, mm. right? Then what I'm left with is, as we observe more and more things, less and less possible coherent explanations, mm. right? But even as our observations keep stacking up, there's still multiple possible coherent explanations, right? Yeah. So, for example, up until 1850, right, we could have explained all our observations in physics, or most of the observations in physics, with Newton, or we could have used Einstein general theory of relativity. We could yeah. have used both of them. Except, yeah. I guess, with Einstein, like, Einstein's whole thing was accounting for the, like, light, the small correction, right? There's no reason to add that small correction if you haven't observed it. So, it, yeah. although it's a possible theory, it's kind of like this wait, why should things act differently? I guess it's a it's a similar thing to about the spaceship and the guy like the person which which one requires the least assumptions to like yes. kind of Yeah. Well validate. there's like all these principles, right? And that's like simplicity and all these these principles. And one of the things that we really value when we're choosing scientific theories is whether not only whether they've been able to coherently explain past events but whether they've predicted something that's happened and then it's happened. Yeah. Right? Because the point with our coherent explanations is if our theory coherently explains something that's happened in the past, there's a pretty good chance that we could use those principles to predict what's going to happen in the future. Now, if it comes along and it does predict something that's happened in the future, we're like, that's our man, right? Yeah. It's going to keep on doing it. Mm. Right? And it keeps on doing it until it breaks down. Yeah. Now, the thing that's really interesting is... There's a number of explanations that could explain past things, and while they're not all going to predict the same number of future things, right, there is a number of theories that is going to grant us some future predictions, mm. right? Now, the fact that there's multiple theories that can do that means that not all those theories can be, like, true in the sense that they perfectly map onto reality. Yeah. Now, I think it could be... The same, and I think this is what you might have been like suggesting with mathematics, right? We come along and we make these like axiomatic statements, right? And we deduce these things, and there's a couple of different axioms that we could do. And even if they're not like, they might get close to reality, they might approximate the truth, but regardless of that, there's still tools that we can use to not in this case predict future events like what we want to do in science but to map onto reality um, how a ball might fly or something like that now this brings in the point of like 
that's what science might do. Mm-hmm. And we've got maths and what maths might do. What I want to ask you is like, what's the difference between those two? Is math science? Is maths a science? Kind of that. Well, that I guess that's one question. But yeah, even if even if we applied the term science to maths, and like this is like demarcation between science and non-science is like a whole other topic. But regardless of that issue, what's going to be the difference between say maths and a quintessential science like physics? I think that, um, I guess going back to your analogy with like the chair getting knocked over and like the aliens <laughs> coming through the window, I think, uh, I think maths, it's axioms that he uses as his foundations are more simple. It's, it's not, it's more of like this concept of like one plus one is two and something like that, or the circle is a, you know, a circle is a circle. I don't know how else to say it. But, like, um, the definition of a circle, the definition of these different constructs, and I feel like that in itself is very simplistic and very, um, maybe just, like, we're all human, right? Like, we're, we're very familiar with the concept of two items just because we've lived on this world for, like, 18-plus years, right? But um, I think that... These ac- these axioms that we use, there is little room for error. They've been they've been well, exa- they're definitions. It, well, I, that's the, I'm not entirely sure whether they're all definitions. I think there's also like certain properties. Like one plus one is two, depending on how you define two. Like I mean, and I'd prefer not to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it seems like we're just going down some other rabbit hole. But. <laughs> But I feel like um, those sort of things is much less room for error. Um, and because of that, and there are things also that have been around for thousands of years, and I, I'm not going to argue to tradition, but I feel like um, if they were wrong, um, if, I'm, I'm pretty sure some very smart mathematicians a few thousand years ago would have seen it. But I think um, in that regard, I feel like it is very fundamental too. It's fundamentally different to physics because whereas we're drawing off the same axioms again and again and again, um, physics is kind of coming up with new theories to explain events that we don't fully understand. Um, and the world itself is completely, like, it's, it's very complex. I mean, there could be a billion reasons that that chair knocked over. But when we're talking about something as theoretical as one plus one is two, there is much less room for error. Well, I hope so. I, yeah, I hope so too. But I think because of that, because of the fact that there's less axioms and be, they're all very fundamental and they're all very um, non-complex, the results that they lead to and the, the like deductively valid results that they lead to are then, then well, yeah, the deductively valid, so they're true, given the axioms are true, uh, given those premises are true, and then that can it basically builds this like upside down pyramid you could like say where the tip is like the tip at the bottom is like the axiom the axioms that build it up and all these theorems come come flowing down as long as the axioms are true and all the theorems along the way are true and all the maths is done correctly (laughs) that's uh something else that you need but like um (laughs) but um it just everything flows from that i think um in that regard, it is very, very different to something like chemistry and physics. I feel like the perspective that you have that um, science isn't the chasing of truth is actually a very enlightened perspective because especially with COVID happening, people and all this like, you know, like evidence was constantly evolving from like case one, you hardly know anything to case two where you know more, like quite a bit more. And like, it's just like, since all this information is flowing in, you're trying to explain it. Well, and like we, we're, we're like making all these observations, right? And we're like, here's a possible theory. And then we're like, yeah, no, not that one. Yeah, not like, that because one. Because we made this, like that theory would have predicted this and that just didn't happen. Yeah. And right? some and of then, those. And then we go on to this new theory and that theory goes like, bang, prediction, bang, prediction, bang, prediction. But didn't predict that one. 
okay, can we construct this new theory or, or can we alter the new theory so that it can explain those things and then make more predictions into the future? Yeah, and I feel like a lot of the kind of advice given out from health experts and stuff during that like pandemic and stuff was just it also brought into account other factors like economy and travel and stuff like that. So, I mean, with a constantly evolving situation, the science has to change. It's like... It's like a. I heard this quote. I can't remember it exactly, but it was, "When I get new information, I change my mind." What do you do? You know, it's like if you stick in your beliefs, even when information comes along that disproves them, <laughs> then it's like, what are you doing? You're just like using this faulty belief to govern the way you act and the way you um, perceive the world. Well, one of the big problems. And I'm wary about going too deep into philosophy of science, but mm-hmm. one of the deep problems in philosophy of science is knowing when to reject a theory. Because one of the big problems is when I make an observation, right? Say, say my theory, my astronomical theory predicts that there's going to be a star in this particular point at a particular moment in time, right? Now, if I look at my telescope or through my telescope up to that point in space at that particular time and I don't see a star there, it's not immediately the case that that disproves my theory because that observational statement itself rests on other theories as well, right? It rests on theories about the nature of the telescope, it rests on theories that there's not cloud between the telescope and the star that we're meant to be observing and there's just as much reason to say like reject the observation as there is to reject the theory that we used to predict what was going to happen now that's like another rabbit hole that we're going to not go down right now yeah i guess it it depends on like how much you believe in your theory because if it's just something you dreamt up then (laughs) maybe maybe (laughs) maybe in that regard you'll be like oh crap okay i was wrong (laughs) with that it's like this whole big it's not just like it's not just like a scientific issue it's almost like a sociological issue Mm. like how do we how do humans decide which one to project Mm, yeah and it's really interesting that say in maths we don't have like those same sorts of problems I was reading something the other day, I think because Immanuel Kant was either inspired by Euclidean or non-Euclidean geometry. Do you know what the difference between those two things is? I think Euclidean is... um, I'm probably going to anger some mathematicians out there because (laughs) I don't exactly know. (laughs) (laughs) Pythag wakes up from his grave. (laughs) Yeah pick up their right angle measures and <laughs> come after me or something. But I think, um, like, in terms of Euclidean, it, you can think of it as um, kind of like a grid. So if you think of a two-dimensional grid, that would be 2D Euclidean space, and then a three-dimensional grid would be... Um, so kind of this lattice would be 3D dimensional space. And I think the, the thing is, like, it's composed of cubes. So that is the, like, fundamental thing. And then you can, you can also have, like, non-Euclidean space... Um, I'm not too familiar with it. I think it's more like um, you can have, if you have like the center point of um, space, you can define things as distances from that center and angles above like this horizontal. So it's kind of like spheres instead. So you have like a small sphere and then outside of that you have a bigger sphere and a bigger sphere and a bigger sphere. And points in that sphere are defined as measurements from either the vertical or like around an axis. Um, so then, I mean, you can, that's a completely equivalent way to kind of represent uh, motion through space or represent coordinates. It's just very different. And it depends, of course, what you're trying to do, right? Um, if you've got like a, quite a lot of, um, s- for some reason, if you're dealing with spheres um, about that point, or you're, de- or you're even like dealing with orbits of a planet around um, the Earth, then that spherical way of looking at it might be very good. Um, but I think we default to Euclidean for quite a lot of things because it's easy. <laughs> well, it's really cool that we've 
kind of come along, made some either really, really fundamental observations and some axiomatic definitions to go with it, constructed this crazy system and then we can use it to do shit. I guess one of the questions that I just want to ask you now is, I mean, what sort of shit do you want to do with it? Like, why why are you studying applied maths? Like, well, why am I studying? Yeah. Why? Well, not just you, but like, yeah, why, why does, does anyone, anyone want to study applied why maths? Why does anyone? I think you can even do it to why does anyone want to study maths, full stop. Because um, I think there's, I mean, when I, when I talk to people about why study maths, uh, I remember, like, in high school, people would be in classes like, Miss, when are we ever going to use this? And that's a fair question. Um, but I think uh, to those people, I'd say, do you need to drive? Like, does someone need to learn how to drive? Well, I'm going to the beach after this, so... <laughs> exactly. It, I feel like learning to drive, you don't have to. I mean, you can take the bus and the train everywhere. You can ask your parents for lifts. It's like, you don't have to learn how to drive. Um... But doing so opens opportunities, like for you to go to the beach straight after um, without having to wait on the bus and train for like an hour and a half. Um, or it, it opens these opportunities, opens these doors. And like the thing is with maths is, as you were saying before, it, uh, it allows you to uh, think through problems logically. So I think that's, I guess, the main pull for uh, people hiring mathematicians. It's like they... They can do math. They know how to break down a problem and think about it logically. What That's... sort of problems are they dealing with, though? So, it, I guess, um, very analytical role. So, like, uh, it's more like management consulting. They would look towards mathematicians. Um, even people, like, in, like, major firms and stuff, they want people who can solve problems because lots of companies have problems that they want to solve, whether it be... Uh, in terms of efficiency or um, something that's just not working properly or uh, and I think I mean as scientists as well obviously yeah exactly I think um, I guess lots of science is about solving problems as well um, and they have to use the tools that mathematics provides in many cases yeah I, I think um, I guess when it comes to mathematics the the difference between a math uh, applied mathematician and a physicist uh, is depending on the field in physics is pretty thin. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'd, I I won't be surprised if a lot of physicists identify as mathematicians as well because it like it's not that they're using the maths as physicists; it's that they are mathematicians as well. They're just yeah using well, the same principles. I'm pretty sure, and I mean, I don't know half enough about physics to make this statement with any sort of justification but I have heard that a lot of modern physics theorems are like just math yeah like they're just math yeah yeah like uh, literally just equations yeah I think a lot of physics in general is just there. there is a lot of maths like um, in order to study physics you need to uh, do multivariable calculus which it's kind of like specialist on steroids. Um, <laughs> and then specialist maths on steroids. Yeah, and then that doesn't sound funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to do a unit above it, which is kind of like multivariable calculus on steroids. <laughs> so it's like learning all these different theorems, like uh, these differential equations which like kind of govern the m motion of uh, items in a specific like environment. So that's very useful for physicists. Um, who are looking like electric fields and stuff like that. And, yeah, for that reason, I'd, I'd suspect that lots of physicists think of themselves as mathematicians as well. I mean, they are mathematicians, yeah. Well, I have to say, man, I didn't think that philosophy and maths and science could be so interesting together. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks yeah. for coming on. Yeah, no worries. Have an awesome weekend. Yeah, you too, man. <laughs> Enjoy the beach.